Hello there. Ever wonder about the life of one of the greats to ever walk this planet Earth? Well, today's video is all about discovering Rembrandt's life and the legacy of a new art movement that he left behind. When we think about the mystery of an artist's life, a few questions may arise. What motivated the artist? Why did he paint what he did? Was he a prosperous painter who could afford a large art collection of his own? And what's with all the portraits? Why did he choose the color palette that he did? Who was by his side throughout his journey? And why are some of his paintings are worth way more than $33 million and others are deemed new nearly as priceless as Mona Lisa. Well, why don't we dive in right into this master's life. Rembrandt was born in 1606 in the Dutch Republic, today known as the Netherlands. He was born in a large city, Leiden, to a well-off family. His mom, Cornelia, was a daughter of a baker and his dad, Harmon, was a miller. Fun fact! Rembrandt was ninth out of 10 kids in his family. Imagine what a fun household was that. Three of Rembrandt's brothers took up baking and milling as a family business and carried on with it. Around 13, 14 years of age, Rembrandt enrolled in one of the oldest European universities, the University of Leiden. That wasn't too uncommon for 1620s. However, art historians argue whether Rembrandt actually started his studies at this university, or was it just a way to escape the military conscription? Around the same time, Rembrandt starts studying art. His first teacher is Jacob von Svanenberg. Jacob taught him all the basics. Rembrandt thought it'd be easier to jumpstart his art career in a bigger city, so he decides to move to Amsterdam. He moves there for about six months, and in that time, he meets his wonderful mentor, Peter. Peter Lastman's teachings were based on Renaissance art. He was heavily influenced by the Italian masters. Peter really laid down the foundation for Rembrandt on how to create a masterpiece. Peter really thought that one of the main ingredients in creating a masterpiece was to have a very important historical, religious, mythological aspect to the painting itself. He really transferred this onto his student as Rembrandt really did paint a lot of thematic paintings. Rembrandt loved creating biblical works of art as he knew religion so well. His teacher also loved the masters who are the pinnacle of art history to this date, such as Michelangelo, Titian, Leonardo da Vinci, Raphael. Rembrandt's full name is Rembrandt Harmonsen van Rijn, but in admiration and as a true follower of the Renaissance masters, Rembrandt only kept his first name and started signing all of his works just as Rembrandt. Young Rembrandt soaked in his teacher's style and he chose medium-sized canvases to paint thematical works as well as using one single light source to paint the portraits. Moreover, he carefully crafted out nearly every single detail on a portrait that you could see and he really focused on getting the perfection of detail. After his six-month apprenticeship in Amsterdam with Peter, Rembrandt returns back to his hometown to really work on his art. For the next five years, he works on portraits, self-portraits, religious works, thematic works, and around the same time, he meets another student of Peter's, Jan Levins. The two work day in and day out on their craft, and to present day, sometimes it's very hard to distinguish which one is a true Rembrandt and which one is a true Levins, as their works are so similar that the ownership is tough to establish between the two by the art historians. As we get into 1630s, the young established painter who's found quite a lot of success with portrait commissions now decides to move back to Amsterdam. 
and he's getting many portrait commissions. Now, what's with all the portraits abundance in the 1630s? Well, around this time, portrait commissions were extremely popular in Holland. Traditionally, we would see many war-themed commissioned portraits dating to the 80 Years War, aka the War of Netherlands Independence from Spain. And we also see many commissioned group portraits by the guilds of merchants and other professionals. Now, many painters painted these portraits, but what distinguished Rembrandt from the others? And why was he so successful? Well, he really relied on his teachings and his foundation in Renaissance art education. He was also the first one to revolutionize the composition of these portraits. Instead of putting everybody in a row like they would in the past of these traditional portraits, he now decided to start composing compositions and structuring the people and making sure that there's a story behind the portrait itself. He started hiding the meanings behind the people's gestures and their poses and their looks. Just like his teacher always said, a true masterpiece needs a very important story to go behind the painting to back up its mastery, just as we see in Renaissance art. And Rembrandt did exactly that, but now with his portraits. You might ask, how did he become so good at painting portraits? Well, he had a lot of practice, and guess what? He chose himself to be his model. So to this day, we see many self-portraits of Rembrandt, which is quite miraculous, to be honest, because we see him age and mature, and we see his technique age and mature, which is quite beautiful. In a way, these selfies, please don't judge, are a beautiful way of looking into his life and witnessing his life through love and suffering of it. His early work is famous for cooler tones, single source of light, and highly detailed work. He really masters out the contrast that we see in the majority of these younger paintings. Take the chemise rough collars, for example. The detail on them is impeccable. Not only did he master the detail, but he also mastered being a chemist in a way to creatively produce new ways of mixing paints in order to achieve that crisp white chemise rough collar. What Rembrandt did was he mixed nut oil along with lead white paint to achieve that crispy white tone versus his colleagues would often mix linseed oil along with the white paint in order to achieve their white colors. However, their white colors really started to have yellowish tone on them, but our incredible uh, creative artist figured out a way how to really show the true whiteness and crispness of this color. His early self-portraits and portraits echo a lot of joyfulness, a lot of playfulness, and they're extremely opulent and rich in their setting and environment. So we really feel that atmosphere when we look at them. There is an actual record of people lining up outside of Rembrandt's art studio to commission him for a painting. Fun fact, in one of his most famous artworks, The Night Watch, the only person who did not pay for the portrait was the drummer who we can see on the side of the picture. So you guessed it. Basically, whoever paid the most in the painting, we can tell right away from the painting itself. They would be right center, they would be the most important person of the painting, and the surrounding second actors are behind. Safe to say, the artist was quite well off from all of these commissions, and he was even able to mortgage out a very large house. 
1633, Rembrandt falls deeply in love with Saskia. The couple wed a year later. In the next couple of years, they had four children together. Only their son, Titus, has survived the childhood. Sadly, Saskia passed away only after being for nine years with each other and she left behind her young son, Titus, as well as her husband, Rembrandt. In moments of such difficulty and grief, the artist could no longer return to the swing of things. He now had a young son to take care of, and he just couldn't focus on all the amounts of commissions that were coming his way. Unfortunately, that's how he lost majority of his clients. In difficult times like these, Rembrandt always found solace in painting religious work. The total number of religious paintings created by Rembrandt come in second place to his portraits. Some say that Rembrandt was one of the few painters of his time to be creating this work. In fact, at this particular time and his geographic location, there were only him and another painter who continuously returned to creating religious paintings. As time moves on, we also start to notice tonal changes in his color palette. His paintings start to lose the coolness and the harsh detailing of everything. His paintings become warmer in palette and freer in brush strokes, for which he did receive criticism two centuries later. In 1640s, we really start to note beige and brown colors dominate his paintings and his mastery of light and contrast yet again supersedes itself. He starts using multiple sources of light and figuring them all out like a puzzle and solving it like a pro. He does find love again in 1649 with Hendrik Stoffels. They welcomed a baby girl and named her Cornelia after Rembrandt's mom. The couple lived in common law until her last days in 1663. Rembrandt loved art. He loved collecting from the Renaissance era. He loved collecting Renaissance prints and sculpture. He also loved getting weaponry from the Roman era. So the shields, the weapons. On top of that, he loved collecting art from Asia, as well as hundreds of pieces of his time local artists in Holland. After his initial financial hardship started after the passing of his first wife, Saskia, the financial condition of his affairs really never improved. And it got so bad that he actually had to start selling his beloved art collection. Especially around 1652, Holland got involved in a war with England, so that put a lot of people in recession and there was really no way out but to sell a lot of what he had. His home was seized, as was majority of his property, in order to avoid going to prison for owing to the creditors. Interesting fact in the situation is that the courts still let him live in this massive house for the next two years until a new owner took over. This house is now Museum of Rembrandt. Even though the family was in financial struggle, thankfully his partner, Hendrik, and his son, Titus, were able to start an art dealership company and they dealt in art, giving some freedom to Rembrandt to keep creating. Amidst all the financial troubles, Rembrandt was still greatly respected and praised in Amsterdam. As time goes on, we see a further shift in his palette and painting technique altogether. He starts working with richer reds, golds, and brown colors. He received his two biggest commissions in 1661 and 1662. Furthermore, as his colleagues stayed in the aesthetic of mid-17th century, his work starts to evolve and it becomes really rougher around their edges, completely free, and just gives off a very different feel with less detail and braver brush strokes eliciting movement and 
the time that we see right in front of us. Hence, leaning away from the norm yet again. Dare I say as a true visionary, pushing the limits of what's possible, figuring out what is his true identity in the art world, and creating something that was never done before. Boy, maybe a new art movement? It's too early for that, but still. In 19th century, his work was sometimes deemed not gracious. However, it was the 19th century that heightened the work of Rembrandt to the same level as the other Renaissance masters like Titian, Michelangelo, Raphael, Leonardo da Vinci. 19th century art historians really described his evolutionary artwork and they described it as something fresh, completely new, and something out of the norm for a mid 17th century. I'd even go as far as saying that he truly became the forerunner for the Romantic movement. And that's why you can't even put a price tag on his work, as it's nearly priceless. So I hope you guys enjoyed this art history lesson on Rembrandt. I can't wait to come back next month with another artist and present it to you guys. Thanks for watching. I'll see you soon. Don't forget to subscribe down below, like right over there. Smash like and subscribe. I appreciate it. See ya.